Alrighty, it is seven o'clock on Tuesday, and you know what that means. It's time to sniffy sniff, swirl swirl, drinky drink, and everything else. So, uh, welcome, uh, friends of Keswick, to Tasting Tuesdays. Um, tonight, we're talking about the Trevelyan Red, the 2019. So, I hope you have this uh, bottle of wine. Um, if you if you didn't know, you hopefully you opened it about an hour ago. It gave it some air. Um, grab a big old glass with, uh, with a big wide sort of brim and um, yeah let's give everyone sort of a minute or two to get on we got a lot to talk about it's been an incredible week and uh, let's say hi to some people so Valerie Shindell hello to you Maureen Hamilton Scott happy birthday for the weekend I'm so sorry to have missed you James Belitho Laura Brown Marsha Sugameli um, there's Catherine Smith and Sylvia Miller and Lynn Pantos and Janice Bryant. Oh my word. Um, hey, you got your guys uh, and girls, you got your tasting uh, Tuesday t-shirts on? Fantastic. Susan Glenn, yay! Hi, Dad. Um, yes, became a father again on, uh, on Thursday. So if I'm smiling, I'm beaming, and I talk really, really quickly, um, super excited but stick with us you'll you'll meet the little bugger in a little bit he's adorable uh linda irvin lanny white cindy schoenberg sam selig hi to the seligs um hope uh, hope everyone's doing all right so i uh, love you guys appreciate everything you've done over the last couple of days sam for for cats so um yeah good evening uh kevin northley jess nelson beth smith congratulations thank you so 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 much let you know mama was amazing baby is doing well uh, both are right next to me we'll uh, we'll introduce you in a little bit so um yeah um all righty it's now 702 so let's jump into it we are talking about this beautiful little wine the trevilian red so pour yourselves a, a glass Let's uh, have some fun for an hour, chat about wine, all things, answer your questions if I may. I've got my beautiful wife uh, next to me, but she's got her hands full. So again, if we don't get to your uh, questions tonight, I'll get on tomorrow morning and answer them. Um, I'm always interested to see if uh, glasses make a, a difference. So, I got two. Uh, one's a little bit narrower and one's a little bit bigger. Um, as I said, the wine has been decanted for a while. Uh, you can see about the same, same, same. And uh, let's jump into it, right? You know. So uh, again, as always, we we hope you're well, and we hope that you've had a, a wonderful week, uh, a weekend. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. I, I know as things get back to normal, work opens, you go about your day. Um, so if you're joining us for the first time or for the 20th time, we really, really, really appreciate it. But we've got a lot to talk about, um, to talk about the Trevelyan, uh, the discounts at the end. We're going to talk about the barrel, the virtual barrel tasting we're doing and how you can get your bundles and uh, answer some questions. And then um, proudly, we're, we're just going to let you say hi to Alakai, which is our, our little guy. Um, so let's jump into it. So Trevelyan Red, it's a it's a blend. It's Cabernet and Petit Verdot, which is a, um, I think it's like peanut butter and jelly. It's just a, a beautiful, beautiful blend. Now, you know we make Cabernet um, our Block 7 and our Block 3, and it's generally our state wine, and Petit Verdot generally goes into our varietal. So where does this fruit come from? Um, now, in 2016, we expanded our vineyard, and we started planting Cabernet Franc, and then in 17 we planted Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot, and then 2018 we put a 13 additional acres in. So we actually put in 20 acres. We, we increased our, our vineyard by 50%. Now, we took a long time to figure that out, right? Because, um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that when we planted vines in the ground, we wanted to make sure that, number one, we planted the right varietals in the ground that would give us the opportunity to make incredible wines for the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, right? We wanted to look for sort of soil and characteristics that we really, really liked based on previous vintages, um, and that was well-drained soils, soils without a lot of clay. And again, we've spoken a lot about it, but uh, any soil or vineyard site that mitigates the effect of rainfall is, is so much better. Now, because we don't have elevation and really steep slopes, 
we have 12 and a half percent as our, our slope gradient and that's as much as we get so we get some runoff but what we do have is incredibly well drained soils so this is in the back of the property now the fruit for this comes from the block planted in 2017. Now, why did we use Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot in the Trevilian Red? I'll tell you why. Because it's a young, young, young block. It's the first fruit that we got of it. We don't really know sort of the flavor profiles. We were very, very happy with the wine. I think you're gonna love this wine. Um, but it's, it's, it's gonna take some time for this vineyard to, to kind of get established, to generate some roots, to become balanced, and I think the, the fruit from these vineyards are gonna produce some of the best wines that we can possibly make. But for now, they're gonna go into a, a wine that I think is phenomenal. It's lovely, it's bright, it's got fruits, it's drinkable, it's somewhat ageable. Um, and yeah, let's, let's jump into it. So how do we talk about reds? Reds are very, very different to whites. And I know for the last three weeks, we've really jumped into sort of white wine production. And, and some of the sort of the chemistries that we look at when we talk about whites. Now for reds, we're looking at things very, very different. Now reds obviously are gonna be harvested in, in September into October. Uh, we always wanna get 180 days after bud break. And that for me is sort of a theoretical um, benchmark to see if our grapes are ripe. Now when we talk about ripeness, remember we're not talking just about sugars. Because if you measure sugars, sugars are not really sort of indicative of physiological or phenolic ripeness. And when you talk about phenols or phenolic compounds, you're talking amongst other things about tannins. Now tannins are really, really, really important for reds as is color development. So the first thing we do is when we're sampling grapes, obviously we're looking at sugar, we're looking at pH, we're looking at acidity, but we're also chewing the skins. We're looking at that color because remember the color is in the skins, it's actually not in the pulp. When you crush a, a grape and you just squeeze it very gently, you get colorless, very clear juice. So we wanna make sure that when you chew the skins, you, you kind of discard the pulp, you chew the skins, you kind of press it into your hand and you can see the sort of the color that you can get. More importantly, you're also looking at seed development. You wanna make sure initially those seeds are green and then they go sort of blonde and light brown and then they go really, really dark brown. They become somewhat lignified. We're also looking at lignification of stems. You know, stems, we, we often talk about how we de-stem the fruit, um, but sometimes if the stems are lignified, we actually add the stems into the fermentation process to extract natural sort of tannins into the wine. And what that does is it allows us not to add sort of enological tannins into the wine. So again, the philosophy is we want to make wines that are respective of the vineyard, the soil, because again, that's the only thing that makes our, our vineyard or our winery unique is our, is our vineyard, it's our soil, it's our elevation, it's our road density, it's our plant orientation, it's all of the above. So again, our intention is to reflect in this beautiful glass of wine, how the grape was grown. Now then obviously you need some help from mother nature, you need a good growing season, you need water early on, you need it to be dry, you need to be able to pick at those parameters that allow you to make the kind of wines that you have in your mind. You know, we always have an idea of what we want to make. Now in 2018, we knew really early on that we couldn't make those kind of wines and we sort of pivoted. We went a totally different route, which I think is very typical of Virginia. So the fruit for this uh, wine is phenomenal fruit. It's just young and it's gonna take time to develop and it's probably gonna take the next three to five to seven years before number one, we really learn how to grow the fruit how to manage the fruit, the crop levels, but I really, really, really think if we can do it right, this fruit is planted on the real estate on the, on the property, the prime area. And then the only block that's better than this is the block that we planted in 2018. So I am excited about the future. I still think the best wines are to be made um, from fruit that has been planted, but will take some time. Okay, so Trevilian, it's obviously, it's a generic name. We spoke about the Battle of Trevilian through the Civil War, um, which was what, 1861 through 65. This was in June, it was a cavalry battle. The name came from a, um, a local wine writer, historian, Hilda Lee, and it was the bloodiest cavalry battle. Over a thousand Union soldiers were lost into this and about 800 uh, Confederates were lost. So it was actually the bloodiest of battles um, in the in the Civil War and it was an all cavalry battle. So it was uh, a sort of a play on words. We're obviously very close to Trevilian Station, which was the site of the cavalry battle. And because of the blood spilled and red, you know, back then it, it seemed apt. So 
how do we make wine? Um, and let's uh, let's take a look at some pictures. So first, we want to look at the grape. You know, and there's a um, what I would say is a pretty healthy looking grape. If you look at that cluster, you don't see any rot, you don't see any shatter. The berries are actually um, fairly sort of uniform in size. Now what we do is you're looking at the cluster from the outside, meaning that side of the cluster is actually exposed, exposed to sunlight. And you can see that it's not shaded by leaves or anything like that. We do a lot of leaf pulling within the fruit zone. Sunlight is really, really, really important. Number one, it minimizes what we call methoxypyrazines, or IPMPs, or IBMPs, isopropyl and isobutyl methoxypyrazine, which are the sort of the very herbaceous, the capsicum flavors. And there's reason to suggest that these um, compounds actually photodegrade. So making sure the, uh, the canopy is adequate, because you need leaves to photosynthesize and produce sugars, but if you allow the fruit to see some sunlight, you can actually minimize sort of green characters in the wine. Now remember, we're talking about Cabernet Sauvignon, and unlike Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Franc sort of, there's an acceptable amount of sort of bell pepper flavors that can go in that wine, right? It's almost expected. It's almost a varietal characteristic in, in, in Virginia. But when you're talking about Cabernet, people don't want green. They want sort of rich, dense, dark, black fruits. So again, we do very, very serious work in the canopy, making sure that we have enough leaves to photosynthesize and produce the sugars. But we wanna make sure that that fruit is not sort of covered by leaves and in, in sort of um, shade. Because number one, it's not gonna get sunlight, it's not gonna develop sort of color. And more importantly, you know, everything that we do spray-wise, it's just gonna hit the outside of the canopy, it's not really gonna go in. So this is a very, very, healthy cluster, um, one that we would be very, very happy to pick if all chemistry kind of sorts it out. So we generally pick by hand, and then what we do is we go through something called um, destemming. Uh, let me see where that is. Um, I'm having a little bit of issues with the, uh, with, the, with the photos, so I'll try and bring that up in a little bit. Um, but what we then do is we, we bring the, uh, the fruit to the crush pad and um, we, we kind of destem it. And as the, as the name suggests, we actually pick the, pick the, the fruit and we actually destem it. So we sort the berries from, from the stems. And that's important because the stems can really impart um, bitterness, you know, and those are different types of sort of tannins in there as well. Um, so firstly, we pick by hand. So there's a, there's a photograph of picking by hand. We pick into little crates or lug boxes, about 25 to 30 pounds. Now this is important because picking by hand is really a quality control measure because skilled, skilled pickers, and we have them, um, they know what to pick and what to leave, right? So that's really, really the first sort of quality control. And then what we do is we, we take it to the winery, and this is a machine, and there you can see the stems that are actually discarded. We're not gonna use these stems. You can see there's some sort of sort of greenness in there as well. They're pretty lignified in that they're brown, but this is what destemming does. This is the discarded sort of material. And what we are looking for is the berries. Now the berries are being sorted on a bell table. So this is really important because the machine doesn't remove 100% of the MOG or the material other than grapes. And again, if we can remove five, 10% of that material, you're just giving yourself the chance to make better wine. So it's very, very sort of labor intensive. You're doing about a half a ton an hour. And when you've got five tons of fruit, you're looking at 10 hours on the sorting table. The other thing you'll notice is the berries, the berries are actually intact. Again, it's another thing that we've done um, over the last couple of years. We don't actually crush the berry. We just, we've taken those rollers that can really macerate those grapes. We open those rollers up, they go through the distemma, we sort the, the berries, and then what we do is we get that fruit into the fermentation tank. And then as the fermentation commences, remember we're talking about a, a berry that gives you white juice. So the biggest difference between a red and a white is that the reds are fermented on their skin. So we can ferment in a couple of, couple of ways. This is actually fermented in one ton fermentation bins. Now fermentation very simply is the sugar in the form of glucose and fructose turning into alcohol. A byproduct of that fermentation that generates heat. So that process is what we call exothermic because it generates heat in the form of ADP, which is adenine, 
uh, adenosine triphosphate, excuse me. Um, the other thing that it generates is carbon dioxide. And what it does is it presses and pushes the skins to the top and it uh, uh, forms a layer or a cake or a cap now what we're doing yeah is we're punching the cap down we're actually trying to homogenize the whole whole fermentation bin if we don't want to punch it down what we can do is pump it over this is a mechanical process where we take the wine from the bottom and we pump the wine over the caps now this does a couple of things it regulates sort of the temperature within the um, within the tank it generates oxygen which is needed for the yeast and the survival of the yeast and more importantly, it wets the cap and it gets as much of the fermentation juice in contact with the, uh, the skins as possible. Now we do this uh, dependent on the harvest. There's no sort of set way. We can do it uh, three days every two hours. We sometimes back it off and do it three times a day or twice a day. That's very much dependent on the skins and the tannin level. Because remember, if you're getting grapes that are ripe, you're going to extract those flavors. But if you're dealing with grapes that are underripe, and slightly green and slightly bitter if you're gonna punch over really you know regularly and you're gonna pump over a lot all you're gonna do is make a wine that tastes chalky astringent and bitter and we don't want that so we want color extraction but what we're looking for is tannins that are soft and silky and supple and sort of coat your mouth but we never want to feel like you've swallowed a desert if you have then you know we're doing something wrong so this is punching down or um, you know kind of pumping over and and the the difference really is, this is a big lot. This would be in a five ton open top fermenter and the bins are one ton. So it allows us to take the five tons and actually break it up into one ton lots. And that's really important for experimental purposes. We also want to learn. There's different yeasts and additives and fermentation temperatures. There's a lot of data that we get every day once we test the, the ferments. Um, and we wanna make sure that we learn and we, we take the good and the bad and we apply it to the following year's vintage. Because again, remember, we always say these wines are better than last year, but they're never as good as the next, all right? Once the wine is done fermenting, this is what happens. We draw the wine off the, off the skins. Um, so you can see we have a bin underneath. We've siphoned all the wine off. That wine then gets taken into a tank. Some poor soul has to get into that tank and shovel out all those skins. Um, and then what we do is we transfer it to the press. Um, again, pressing is just as important for the red wines as it is the whites. Now, when we're talking about whites, we're pressing whole clusters. Um, and we speak very often about the light press or the free run juice, not pressing too heavily. Same thing with the reds. You know, you're going to extract bitterness and astringency and chalkiness and, and sort of, you know, tannins that are really, really not nice. You know, so we press very gently, we taste it, um, we initially keep the free run, and the free run is essentially what came from, um, from there. That is free run wine. You know, it's wine that's just sat on the skins, that is your free run wine. It's regarded as actually the best quality wine. The pressing wine comes out of the press. You get your light press, your medium press, your heavy press, and then your really, really heavy press. And there are sort of sensorial differences from sugar, the pH goes up, um, you know, and, and what we do is we tend to sort of cut the press fractions and then we blend them back in or we keep them separate depending on the quality of the vintage as well, right? Um, and that's about it. So that's that's the red wine. It, it Again, it still starts with the quality of the vintage and then picking it at, at sort of parameters that allow you to, to make wines. And in this case, what are we trying to go for? We're trying to make wines that are, again, they're, they've got to be beautifully colored, right? If you look at this, I mean, it's just got this gorgeous, gorgeous sort of dark garnet, crimson kind of color. Um, now, color is not the most important factor when it comes to wines, but you do taste with your eyes, especially when I think you deal with Bordeaux or Cabernets or Syrahs or Tanats. You have an expectation that the wines are dark. You know, you put your hand behind it, you can't see it. And that's that's kind of expected. If we were to say, hey, folks, here's our Trevelyan. It's Cabernet based, but it's light and it's pink. Psychologically, you're going, eh, something, something's not right, right? So color is, is not the most important, but it is kind of psychological. And I think if you look at these, these glasses, there's some beautiful sort of dark extracted color. Now, we don't want to over extract, right? Because at the end of the day, what's more important to me is the aromatic potential of the wine, which really sets yourself up for, for the palate. So here we go, folks. Cheers, and, and let's give it a sniffy sniff. So 
Again, you're going to give the wine a, a swirl, and what we're doing is we're volatilizing esters. And again, to, to recap, volatility by definition means the ability to vaporize. So what I would suggest is putting it in a, in a big sort of glass like this. But just for interest's sake, I put it in sort of a more narrower glass because I really want to see if glass, stemware, and the size of the glass makes a difference. So cheers. Salute to your health. God bless you all. Let's, uh, let's give it a smell and tell me what you think. All right, um, so initially I get black tea. I don't know if anyone else gets this. I get a lot of sort of black tea components and I'm, I'm double fisting here, so excuse me, but not so much in this because this is actually a little bit more aerated, but I get a, a really lovely sort of black tea component in the wine. A little bit of sort of graphite or um, pencil lead. You know, it's a it's a term that we don't talk about. The the tasting room staff always go, "What the hell is pencil lead?" You know, when you chew on your pencil in school sometimes, but it has that sort of graphite, stony kind of character, which is which is really really lovely. And then um, I get a lot of sort of floral kind of con uh, components. You know, sort of Provencal herbs, um, lavender and lilac and violet, which I always find with our, our young Bordeaux block kind of grapes and and where that comes from I have no idea um, but I really really love what it does to the wine and the fruits a little muted let's be honest um, I think this needs probably a good couple of hours for for the wine to to sort of aerate and open up um, but I think you know I've, I've decanted this for a few hours and you, you get really sort of darker spectrum. And when I talk about darker spectrum, I don't mean sort of cherries and raspberries and currants and pomegranates and cranberry, that sort of thing. I'm thinking more sort of darker fruits. So blueberry, blackberry, plum, cassis, which is, um, you know, French for black currant. There's some chocolate in there as well. But honestly, this is a, a quite a complex nose. There's a hell of a lot going on in this wine. So this really, really makes you intrigued about what sort of the palate's going to taste like. So let's jump on in. Remember, take one initial sip, swirl it around, swallow it, and then jump in and do a, do a second sip. So again, cheers. All right, so um, for me, and again, remember, wine is drink what you like, how you like, when you like. But what I really love about this wine, and it's been, um, I don't drink this too often because it's just been in the bottle for about a month, but I really like sort of the fine green tannins. You know, you can feel that it's dry, right? You can feel that there's some woodsy and oaky kind of, kind of characters in there, but it's really well balanced. There's some fruit on the back end that transition from mid to sort of back palate, it's some really lovely fruit. But what I really like about the wine is it's is quite fresh and vibrant. You know, it's got it's got sort of life. It's got sort of liveliness to it as well. You know, we don't want to make wines that have got sweetness and sweetness alone or alcohol and alcohol alone and tannin and acid. Again, these are the components that make up a wine. But what we are looking for is a wine that's quite balanced and harmonious. And what I really, really do, I, I think this wine is, is, is fairly balanced. And again, you know, that's the first sort of impression. So let's uh, let's take a second sip and, and see what you think. And then there's this beautiful sort of sweetness um, in the wine as well. And then when we talk about sweetness, um, sweetness doesn't just come from, um, from sugar, obviously. It also comes from a, a, a barrel. Um, you can get sweetness from oak, you can get sweetness from fruit, and um, yeah, I I just really, really, really sort of love this wine. I think it's a, a beautiful wine, even though it's young, but it's really, really bright. The One of the questions I see right now is the bricks at a harvest. This ranged from 23.8 to about 25, so certainly not, um, not super sweet and super over the top, but really, really ripe. Again, we're not looking for sort of 15, 16% alcohol. We're looking for 13, 8 to about 14, 5. We're looking for moderate alcohol levels. We're looking for fruit. We're looking for tannin. We're looking for acidity. Um, the blend, by the way, it's dominantly Cabernet Sauvignon. It's got like 13% Petit Verdot. Now, what Petit Verdot does to the blend is 
Um, in this case, it, it doesn't provide all the color it can, but the Cabernet was plenty dark enough. But it does give you some tannin and it does give you some acidity. And the Cabernet had really, really sort of um, lovely sort of mid palette. The other thing uh, we should talk about is the barrel. There is no new oak on this wine, meaning that we're not using barrels that have I've never been used before. We're using barrels that are seasoned, that have been used at least two or three times. Why that is important is because a barrel in its first year is going to impart about 50% of its oak, then 25, then 12, and 6. So we, oak is important, yes. You know, you need the oak, you need the structure, you need the tannin from the derived from the barrel. But we never want to kind of have a barrel be the primary sort of focus of the wine. We never want you to be like, yep, that smells like a barrel. It's got that mocha, that burnt sugar, that coffee, that burnt oak kind of toast. Because the the plain simple thing is 2019 was an extremely beautiful, well-balanced, incredible, incredible vintage. I would have just screwed it up by putting some oak on it. And then the other thing that we would have to have done is we would have had to age this wine for that sort of tannins to soften and that fruit to come through. So um, seven months in barrel only, all season barrel two, three, and four. We, we gave it a little bit of a fining. What I mean by that prior to bottling, we find a little bit with egg whites and egg white is uh, albumin or proteinaceous. And by definition, um, tannins and proteins precipitate and bind. So what we did, we just wanted to soften the tannins on a little bit and make a wine that I think is, is balanced, it's vibrant, it's got color, it's got depth, it's got aromatics. And honestly, it makes you want to drink the whole dang bottle. Um, in fact, I almost have, you know, I'm down to about a glass. And that, if ladies and gentlemen, is if uh, you're kind of drinking and all of a sudden the bottle's gone, is uh is not a bad thing whatsoever aging potential i think this wine will drink incredibly well from about three to five up to about eight or nine give or take you know our cabernets do age they historically age really really well um the petite verdot giving it that structure i think is going to add to that as well you know you want to keep this in sort of correct cellar facilities now we don't always have you know underground cellars with humidity and 55 degrees constant so keep it away from light um, make sure the temperature doesn't fluctuate it's okay if it's sort of you know 59 60 61 62 it just means your wine is going to age a little bit quicker than if you gave the wine 55 so if you want to really really sort of enjoy this wine yeah you can enjoy it now i mean i'm really enjoying this wine right now but i'm really intrigued and i really do believe that if you can exercise some patience that from year three to five up to about eight or nine I think this wine is going to be phenomenal. Again, we spoke about aging potential being the time it takes to reach peak is the exact amount of time that it stays at peak. In other words, after bottling, if it took four years to reach peak, it's going to stay at that peak for four years, and then it's going to sort of, you know, kind of age. And um, the other thing is, not everyone loves what age does to a wine. So, you know, if you like fruit and vibrance and bright, drink the wine young. If you, um, if you like wines that are going to show you the incredible vineyard and the vintage, you know, give this wine some time. I think time is going to be really, really, really good to this wine. Um, but again, let's just double check and then let's take some, some questions. And um, the other thing is, just jumping here, these wines are remarkably different in these two glasses. I was always bloody skeptical with glasses until we did... A, a tasting with Riedel, um, kind of putting the same wine in different glasses. And it's amazing how the shape of the glass, you know, uh, really, really has an impact. So again, if you're going to go to the trouble of drinking a half decent bottle of wine, put it in a half decent glass. Um, again, I wouldn't put it in a polystyrene cup. If you're going to do that, just drink it out of the damn bottle. All right. So 2019 Trevelyan, I think it's a beautiful wine. And here's the exciting thing. I'll give you a hint. This is the lightest wine that we're going to make this year if you love this wine you're going to love what's coming out the merlots the cab francs the petite vidos the cab savs uh, and we're going to tell you in about 20 minutes how you can get a sneak peek of those wines so um let me see if there's any any questions and uh let me turn it over to to my beautiful wife and um nope um she is looking after the little guys so let's see 
Um, um, Andrea Peters asked, why is the blending percentage not listed on the bottle? Oh, um, you know, uh, was it from Andrea? Mm -hmm. Andrea, the, the question was, why is the, the blend not listed on the bottle? Firstly, we're not required to. We, we do do it with our heritage and some other wines. But if you go to our website and you go on the tech notes and you click on it, those blends are always sort of um, made known to you as well. We have very, very small amount of sort of space on the label to give you all the information that we want. So what you do if you have any questions about how the wine was made, the bottling, the pH, the acidity, go to our website, keswickvineyards.com, click on the wine, go to the tech notes, and they will tell you everything that we did to the wine. But uh, you know, that's about it. So um, Mary says, readable glasses are the best. They certainly, they certainly are phenomenal glasses. Um, you know, I, I think again, you know, don't, don't discount the value of stemware. If you're going to invest, if you're a wine drinker, if you love wine or getting into wine, but you have a passion for wine, invest in two glasses, you know, a generic white and a generic red. It is, it is so much better drinking wine out of a decent glass versus not. So I, I agree. Marianne, I hope you're doing well. Um, let's see what else is there. Um, Percentages again, Dennis Ugumeli, it's 87% Cabernet Sauvignon and 13% Petit Verdot, which meant that we could have quite honestly labeled this wine as Cabernet Sauvignon. And although I think it's phenomenal, I don't think it's quite at the level of um, I don't think it's quite at the level of our, our Cab Sav. This is this is Alabama, this is LSU. You know they're good for collegiate, but the Cab Sav, those are the Patriots. They're Super Bowl champs. And that's our that's our high end wine. So I think this these grapes, this vineyard is going to make it into those top end wines. But I think it takes time for the vineyard to to get there. So I think it, it's a phenomenal wine. We wanted to make something that was accessible and drinkable and lovely and over delivered in quality versus price point. And I really, really, really do think the uh, the Trevelyan does that. Janice Bryan says you need to start using regular size bottles. You are too small. Um, yeah, you know, these are these are porous glass because I promise you I only pour myself two glasses of wine and the bottle's gone. But I agree with you. So uh hope you're doing well, Janice. Always a, always a pleasure to see you on here as well. So um uh Kevin Norfleet, I'm sorry, sweetie, I didn't mean to interrupt. Kevin Norfleet said, How many cases did you make? Uh we did three hundred cases, uh Kevin. So a, a fair amount. Um but um yeah, so three hundred cases to to answer your question. So Donegal asks, are punch downs or pour overs better? Or is it the maker's preference? And which do you Ooh, use? that is a phenomenal question. Are punch downs or pump overs better? Um, it's a hard one to answer. I think depending on the vintage, you know, one might be better suited than the other. And again, we don't have a book. I wish we had a book. I wish we had a recipe for rain years and moderate years and drought years and how to make wines. Um, a lot of what we do is purely on feel and taste. You know, if we're pumping over and uh, the, the ferments are running away from a bit and we're over extracting, we might sort of back it off a little bit and either pump over less in a day or we might go down to sort of punching down. I think when you're pumping over, you, you're running it through a pump. You might sort of break open the seeds a little bit. So a lot of it is dependent on the vintage and the fruit. Everything we do is dependent purely on all those sort of parameters leading up to that and then we taste and taste and taste so first thing we do first thing in the morning is we get in there we we taste the tanks we measure the sugar we measure the temperature and we play around we we know where we want to get to um so i don't think one is better than the other but i do think uh one is better in certain vintages than the other um i tend to to favor uh, punch downs I like punching downs. We're going into smaller lots into the one ton fermentation bins purely also because it allows us to experiment a little bit. Uh, punching down a five ton tank is rather difficult. Um, and then just for expediency purposes, when you have sort of 10 or 15 or 20 fermentations going and you have to get everything punched down, and you're trying to do three or four punch downs a day. Certainly there is a practicality involved as well and pumping over might be might be the way to go but it's a it's a phenomenal question it's uh you know one's not better than the other to be honest with you so um yeah any other questions love 
Um, Dennis Sugamelli asked, how long was this aged in the barrel and what ages were the barrels? Oh, Dennis, the, the question is, how long was this aged? Seven months in barrel and all the barrels were two, three or four years of age. Again, the reason for that is we, we didn't want a lot of oak on the wine as well. If we got a lot of oak on it, we would have had to sat on this wine and we knew that the wine was getting released. We also know that 85% of wines that are drunk and produced in America are drunk within 24 hours of purchase. So we know most people want to buy and drink and enjoy. So the, the question was, we wanted to make this wine drinkable and accessible and make sure it's fruit forward, but also ensure there's enough structure to allow this wines to age if you chose to. So um, two years, three years and four years in time, seven months total. And uh, I think hopefully, hopefully we got the, hopefully we got the, the balance right. Uh, Kevin Northfleet, how do I get a job tasting every day? Uh, the answer is, you know, open a winery. Um, Al Schoenberg says, buy a winery. So there you go. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's just a, a beautiful wine, but I, I think it's a little bit young. It's quite tight, but it's really, really sort of opening up um, as you as you age it there as well. I think the, the aromatics are really becoming, you know, kind of interesting. And I get a lot of sort of Provencal herbs. Um, I get a lot of sort of violets and sort of purple flower and there's fruits at the back end there as well. I mean, this is a hella complex kind of wine, which I really, really enjoy. I hope you're finding out about it. So let me know if you've got this wine in the glass, what do you think? Do you enjoy it? Do you like it? What's going on? So, um, let's see. Any other questions? When do you think the best time to drink it would be? Dennis, mm. Sugamelli, Dennis Sugamelli, when should you drink this wine? Um... Between 7 and 10 p.m. Um, in terms of when you think it might drink best, it's hard to say. Um, I would love to say it, it It really would be in that sort of 4 to 7, 5 to 8 year kind of range. Given given the, the opportunity to kind of age the wine, you know, correctly, meaning, you know, um, devoid of sunlight, nice cool kind of temperature, slightly humid, I think this wine has has got the ability to age, you know, at least to eight years. I think if you did it that long, you're, you're not rolling the dice longer than that. We just don't know. Um, everyone says it's the hardest question to to sort of answer is how long should you age these wines? And honestly, we don't know. Um, we'd like to believe 10, 12. I mean, I've had our Viognier's from 2002 and our Tariga from 2002 that's phenomenal but would i tell you to age them that long hell no because i never want you drinking a wine thinking that you've aged it way too long because the intention of buying a wine the intention of making a wine is so that you can get um enjoyment um so i think it's great now um, i'm excited to see and this is just the curiosity kills the cat kind of thing as a winemaker i would love to see what this does for sort of three, five, eight years. So I know I'm getting a case and I'm gonna drink a bottle a year and take some notes. Um, but I think this is the stuffing to, to get at least eight, nine years uh, incredibly well. I would buy a few bottles, maybe drink one now, drink it at three, four, five years. Um, nothing wrong with that, but I really, really think this this would see five to eight years might be the, the sweet spot for that. So um, yeah, let me, a lot of people ask, what is your philosophy in a nutshell? And, um, you know, it's always hard to describe. So what I thought we might do while I get our esteemed guests is, uh, is show you. So if you don't mind. What's for like how you like it? It's a fun subject. It's constantly changing. There's so many things that are different. The winemaker doesn't really make the wine, we conserve the wine. We take everything good about a grape, we take those characteristics and we make sure that the, the consumer can taste that in a glass of wine. Winemaking is hard work, it's farming. There's a soil, there's a character, there's a style that really should be traced back not to the winemaker but to, to the place in which it's grown. Every grape cluster we look at is not in terms of how much fruit we can produce, it's what kind of wine it can produce. It's very easy to make wines when you've got people who work exactly like you work, who are, are working to a common goal. Picking's all done by hand. You physically go in and that's your first sort of quality control. We try and, and make wines in a minimalistic fashion. We really want the character of the wines to reflect the, the quality of the fruit. 
we do sorting after destemming and we make sure just the very best fruit, the very best berries go into the fermenter. We punch down very heavily to extract color. Everything we do is with a stylistic god mind. We want to be true to the style of Keswick Vineyards and of our, of our fruit. But production and making wine is just one facet of the business. Arguably, some of the most important people are the people in the tasting room who then present it to the customer. If they do that, hopefully the wines speak for themselves, the customer learns something new, and they walk away not only with wine, but with an experience. And hopefully they come back. Hopefully they join the wine club. Hopefully they tell their friends. And when they do, they'll be hopefully customers and friends for life. That's ultimately the secret of wine, is sharing it and creating a memory that's long-lasting. It's about creating something that for many years to come will provide as much enjoyment to, to future generations as it is right now. Alrighty, so let me be a proud daddy and let me introduce to you Alakai Reese Barnard. Born June 25th, uh, 7 pounds 13 ounces, just an adorable sort of bucket of joy, our pride and joy, our little rainbow baby and um, thank you to everybody that uh, sent us well wishes. I know we try to keep it so um, quiet. Mommy did phenomenally, little guy's doing well and uh, we can't tell you how much we are, are blessed and grateful for this little guy and uh, how much love we receive from everybody and we really, really, really sort of appreciate it. So let me, let me give him back to Mama and then let me tell you about our, our deals, our specials, what's going on, what we're going to do in July and, uh, and then finish up if that's okay. So bye sweetheart. See you in a little bit. Go back to mama. Mwah. Alrighty. So how can you get this Trevelyan? Quite simply, if you are a wine club member, you get 30% off uh, with three bottles. And um, three plus bottles gives you shipping um, for free. But it's only available to midnight. So get on that. The, the price is $38.95. So take 30% of that. I think it's a phenomenal value for this wine. If you're a non-wine club member, that's okay, but why wouldn't you be in the wine club? We would love for you to join the wine club, but again, we're going to give you 15% off, um, you know, but the free shipping is on orders of $149 and above. So if you needed a reason to join the wine club, there's one for you right now. Join the wine club, get your 30%, and uh, get free shipping on three bottles more up until, until midnight. So let's talk about um, the July bundles. This brings to the end a, hopefully what you think is a phenomenal, phenomenal June, June month. Um, we did the Trevelyan White and the Red and the Viognier and the Rosé. Um, so what we wanted to do was give you a sneak peek of our, our wines that have been aging in barrels. So we're gonna send you six wines, 375 ml bottles of six wines. We're gonna give you two Merlots two Cabernet Francs and two Cab Savs, one of which is our 2017 that's been in the barrel for almost three years. $99.95 um, and uh, wine club members get free shipping. And we're not going to taste those wines next week. We're going to give you an opportunity to, to buy those wines and those bundles for, for one week. We're going to ship it out and then we're going to jump in um, the following week and we're going to do two wines per week. We're going to start off with the Merlots We're going to then do the Cabernet Francs and we're going to finish with the Cab Savs You want to get this bundle you want to join us on Tuesday because we're going to give you futures and discounts uh, The opportunity to get these wines early um, But yeah, that's about it. I've had a phenomenal week. Thank you for the birthday wishes Thank you for my wife giving me the most amazing gift this whole world Thank you to everybody who reached out. I, you know, we, 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 we just, um, we're so appreciative of, of everyone who, who took, who took time to just send well wishes. We try to keep it a secret, um, because of, uh, some of the issues of the last, but we, we really appreciate it. So back to the wine though, Trevelyan. I hope you like it. I hope you love it. Um, I do, you know, and again, this is, this is our lightest wine. This is your accessible wine. Um, that's scary to think if this is how good this wine is 
imagine what those those wines that we regard as even better are going to be so um i don't know if it's a thought for the day but it's a, a thought to take with you through the week firstly god bless you and your families you know be safe be kind look after each other i know the world is crazy these are these are tough times these are troubling times these are uncertain times so all you can do is is be the best you can be you know portray kindness you know and um look after your families tell people you love them and again we also just always want to say sort of thank you for for everything our our family um my now growing family and um our winery family our wine club family we we really appreciate all of you um you know it's the it's the reason why this is fun and why this is still you know something we're working hard at to 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 bring you wines that hopefully you enjoy so i know we didn't get to all the questions I apologize. I know we've had some technical difficulties. I apologize. I will get on tomorrow and I will answer every question that you can. Um, talking about uh, 4th of July, a lot of people are asking, are you open? We are. Uh, reservations uh, are required or recommended. So again, please go to our website, keswickvineyards.com. It's our reds, whites, and blue grass. It's a phenomenal day. Happy birthday. Day America. The weather's supposed to be beautiful. Our staff are, are there, are, are going to take care of you. The wine's going to be phenomenal. We have Tara Mills and her band playing incredible music. Um, we will let you know. Check out our website and our Facebook page to, to kind of let you know what we're doing next week. Uh, we're not just going to take a break. We're going to talk about something random, probably old up uh, an old wine or something different. If you have any sort of thoughts about what we should chat about next week, let's do that. But again, on our website, on the homepage, um, the, the the virtual barrel tasting is two Merlots, two Cab Francs, two Cab Savs. We're going to start that not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. So you've got a whole week to get your orders in. Because then my office has to, got to get in there and hand bottle it all. So I'm, I'm hopeful and, and hoping we can, do, we, can, we can do that. So I see... Miller, uh, Washington, and Ryan. Happy birthday to you, Ryan. Linda Haas, um, even though you're Penn State supporters, God bless you. Love you. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, let's who else is there. Uh, Kevin Norfleet, he's got my reservation. Oh, my God. I hope we can see you. I, I don't know if we'll be there, obviously, with, uh, with the little ones. But um, it's, 10 to, it's 10 to 8. So, again, just finishing up. Uh, Trevelyan, Trevelyan Red. It's a pretty little wine. It's Cabernet based with Petit Verdot. It's a, it's a wine you can drink. It's a wine you can enjoy right now. If you're talking about foods, think of the barbecue, spice rubbed, coffee rubbed sort of um, filet mignon or sirloins or ribeye or strip steak or skirt steak. Um, you know, this, this will go really, really well with sort of meat and sort of hearty sort of dishes as well. But it's a wine you can drink. It's a wine you can drink, you can enjoy it, but it's also a wine you can age. And, and hopefully we found the balance between drinkability and ageability. Mary Ann said, what size are the bottles? They're half bottles. They're 375 mils. So that's the perfect bottle for you and your partner. It's a glass each. Um, you know, so we're going to do two glasses. You're going to have a glass of your Merlot and your glass of our other Merlot. We're going to talk. And um, Melissa Jumper said, our internet glitched. Was there a code on the Trevelyan Red discount? I don't think there's a code. You just get onto the website. Everything should be self-explanatory. It's on the homepage, so so jump on in. Um, but 30% on the on the wine club, 15% for for everybody else. Um, again, if you're not in the wine club, we would love for you to join our wine club, to join our family. Again, you know, a wine club just sounds like we're sending wine and taking you money, and that's not what it is. It's about um, education and sharing. And, uh, you know, kind of teaching you about wine, but forming relationships and having you stay in a club that you think you get incredible value, you know, for being in. And uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, Jessica Babington. Oh, my God, Jessica. I hope you and your family are doing well. She says, I need more reds running to the website. Now, the good thing is, Jessica, we have incredible reds coming your way. July 30th and 31st, we're bottling our 2019 Petit Verdot, our Cabernet Franc, and uh, what else are we buying? Our Merlot. The wines that you are getting, these are the top tier. This is the level above. These are the block designated Cab Francs, the block designated Merlots, the three year age Cabernet Sauvignon, which I 
boastfully, I must admit, said was the best Cabernet we've ever made. And our 2019 Cabernet, which we're just going to give you a sneak peek, because that wine is going to spend two or three years in the bottle. Um, but if you want red, uh, it's coming. You know, I know it's been a bit of a wait, but it's, I'll tell you what, the, the wait is well worthwhile. So love to you and David and the family. Hope you're doing well. Thank you for your support. Um, Camilla says the, the wine club is amazing. Thank you so much, Camilla. Again, send my love to Ryan. It's going to be a while. I'm, I'm not going to be back at the winery for a few more weeks, but I will see you all soon. So let me say this. Um, God bless you guys. Have a great day. Have a great week. We'll see you next week, Tuesday. Check us out on our website and social media. We'll let you know what's going on. Um, we probably won't be at the winery for July 4th. So happy July 4th. Have a wonderful day. Tell the folks at Keswick I say hi. We'll be there soon. So thank you for joining us. Join us next week. Get your uh, Take care of the, the Trevelyan. Take advantage if you want to. Take, uh, take advantage of those sort of virtual barrel tastings. I'm excited to share what's coming out in August and beyond with you. Um, I will answer all your questions tomorrow. I know we had some glitches. But again, thank you. God bless. We love all of you uh, from the bottom of our hearts. So... Have a great evening and we'll chat soon. Just uh, six days and 23 hours to wait. But I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.